So to recap, in 30 minutes, we had the world champion in a promo involving what is essentially a love triangle with himself and Adam Cole and Roderick Strong. A great wrestling match for one of the biggest annual prizes on the, in the uh, company. Which is also revenge for an angle so controversial they immediately dropped it. We had a post-match brawl leading to a run-in, leading to another run-in. And then we had, I believe, I counted six different people talking to book and or promote four different MJF matches. Yes. Holy shit. Yeah. So he's got a title match, a tag title match, an eight-man, and another title match on the horizon. When this was done, my head was totally swimming. I was completely exhausted. <laughs> and I was so happy they went to commercial. Well, I don't like to be all gloom and doom. And I don't want to be gloom and doom. But we have to look at some facts right here. So the quarter hours for this show came out. The uh, the whole, you know, the rating for the entire show, actually. And uh, this show did not do a good rating. And what happened was they had a great first two quarters with MJF. Uh, the first quarter started at, ni- it opened at 982. The second quarter, 936. So, you know, the first two quarters averaged 950,000 viewers. And when the first half hour ended, this show fell from 936 to 752. Hmm. They lost almost 200,000 viewers after the first half hour. And then, you know, from that point, it was a it was a normal ratings pattern if you subtract about 100,000 viewers from normal. And I looked at this and I never seen anything like it. It was like the first two go like this and then it falls off a cliff and then the rest kind of does whatever. And I thought, well, you know, the NBA game must have come on because that's like I've never seen a drop like that. Well, it turns out that the NBA games had been on for a while. It was not the NBA games. And uh, what it was to me is that there is a core group of AEW viewers that are going to watch the show every week. And there's about 700,000 of them, okay? And then, you know, anything above that is people that are tuning in for specific storylines or maybe there's a match they really want to see. And uh, and what it seems to me is every single important storyline was all contained in the first 30 minutes. And people were like, okay, well, I saw all of the key developments and the storylines I care about. And, uh, and now, you know, 200,000 people turned off the show. And... I think that that's something that needs to be worked on because, quite frankly, if you look at the lineup for this show, and we're going to talk about the show, I mean, we had Hangman Page and the Young Bucks versus the Hardys and Brother Zay. The Hardys and Brother Zay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I like them, but that's not a marquee match at all. Hikaru Shida against Ruby Soho. I'm sure she's won matches on Rampage and everything like that, but as far as, like, Dynamite... I can't remember the last time Ruby Soho had a match. Not even sure about Collision either. And then we had the main event, which sounded like a great match, but that was at the very end of the show. Rob Van Dam and Hook versus Silver and Reynolds, who, you know, it's Silver and Reynolds. Tony Khan, well, I'll get to that in a minute. A Jericho interview and a Strickland promo. That's what was advertised. The other big thing that they advertised was Tony Khan giving the gift to Sting. And did you hear... The way that Tony Schiavone advertised this on Wednesday day. I, I don't and I'm not blaming Tony Schiavone. Yeah. But he's like, this this gift is going to be unlike anything that anyone has ever been given in the history of wrestling. Hmm. He brought out Ric Flair. <laughs> it's like, the reality is, and people have made fun of it for a while, but it's true. Tony's gone to the well one too many times with... This giant announcement, we've got this huge announcement, this big thing is going to happen. We've we've heard it a thousand times. If you look at the quarter hours for when Sting came out, it was like, they went from 756 to 764. They added nobody for that segment. And it didn't do, I mean, it essentially did exactly the same as everything else in the first, uh, or in the second hour of the show. So... You know, the reality here is that I watch this show, and when it's over, I think the show was good. I liked all of the segments in a vacuum. 
But the fact of the matter is, as far as like, you know, the sequential telling of all of the stories, what in God's name is going on with the Young Bucks? I have no idea. It's like they won the six-man titles and they dropped off the face of the earth. You know, we had another biggest announcement in the history of whatever with Sting and like people didn't tune in for that. You know, Hikaru Shida. I still don't know why she's the champion. I don't know why it's not, you know, Tony Storm versus Soraya. I realize they did that once, but they've done rematches before. But, you know, she just got the champion. She's defending it against Ruby Soho. What is the Hikaru Shida story? There is no story. It does not exist. Rob Van Dam and Hook team up every now and then when, when they're in Rob Van Dam's neck of the woods. For what? They faced Silver and Reynolds. For what? What's the point of any of this? There's no story here. And then, you know, the Jericho telling his story was two minutes. Swerve breaking in a hangman's house was three minutes. So, you know, if you look at, like, how are these stories being told? I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, they're not telling the stories in a way that's getting people to tune in to find out what's next. They're just tuning in if there's a real big match that they want to see. And so I think that there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done overall on the storytelling here outside of obviously mgf's five storylines because clearly people were interested in those but i mean when you run through all five of them in the first 30 minutes you ran off people they're like oh we saw it all that's it we're done and 200,000 people quit for the night that's what happened so we come back from a much needed break and as you noted it's more mjf he's not there but wardlow is just talking about him he was at home for four months in a very dark place, watching this horrible, horrible person, MJF, suddenly become everyone's favorite. The guy he beat is made of any the biggest show in history. There's nothing left for you to take from me, but I will take everything from you. And he's doing this, and he's mean and grumpy and bitter and unlikable. At the same time, he's also running the Rocky Steps to inspire us. And listen, I, I don't want to go on again. I'll keep this short, but this person goes, there's no stories in AEW. Yeah, there are stories in AEW, but... The stories are all revolving around MJF. He's involved in about four stories right now. And the only other sequential story that we're really seeing week after week is Christian and Nick Wayne and Edge. I mean, those are the real ongoing. Like, every week if you turn in, you're going to see something on those stories. Outside of that, it's like, okay, well, you know, Hikarushita won a belt. Ruby won a belt some or a title shot somewhere. And then she lost a title match. I mean, you know, th these fans clearly need more than that. They want a sequential every week I turn in. It's just like, you know, I don't want to compare it to Raw, but, like, if you watch Raw every week, you're going to get more on the Cody story. Every week, you're going to get more on the uh, uh, Judgment Day story. Every week, you're going to get more, like, you can, you can the, the Alpha Academy story. Like, you're going to get more every week on the same stories. It's not like that in AEW. There's two stories you get every week, and the rest are just, you know, some week you get it, some weeks you don't. John Silver and Alex Reynolds versus Hook and RVD. So apparently, no one was watching anymore, but uh, if you were watching, you got to see Rob Van Dam come out to Pantera in Philadelphia. That was pretty cool, I thought. They cleaned house, went to commercial, came back, got a hot tag. We've seen Rob two or three times now in AEW, and uh, he was not in shape didn't appear to be in shape the first two or three times, and uh, he looked much better here. Looked totally fine. And uh, there was a little bit of wonkiness with him and uh, Reynolds being on totally different pages, but eventually makes his big comeback. Hits a huge Northern Light suplex. Evil Uno tries to use a chair. He gets Van Daminatored. He has a spin kick on Reynolds, a frog splash on Reynolds, and uh, Hook taps out Silver with Red Rum. It was a simple match to let fans pop for the nostalgia act, and that's what happened. Yeah, I thought the match was, was good, and I would like to see Hook with... Like a regular, you know. I thought the best thing they did for a while there was when they teamed up Hook and Jungle Boy. Two young guys, give them some wins, head them towards the tag team titles, and then obviously everything happened with uh, with Jungle Boy. But now, you know, it's another one. Hook shows up every now and then. He teams with RVD. He wins. I mean, there's another one. Two years ago, it was like, man, two years from now, Hook's going to be a giant star. Hook is exactly where he was two years ago. Yeah. He's got the FTW title. He shows up every now and then. He wins a match. Then what? That's my question. Then what? Hey, guys. Did you love this clip? 
If so, you should join our channel. Just hit the join button and you'll have full access to every single show that we do. Wrestling Observer Live, Wrestling Observer Radio, The Brian and Vinny Show, all of them in full HD, full length, plus archives of all of your favorite shows. Click join today and don't miss out.